live stream is started and can we have a verbal confirmation that we are when we are broadcasting mr chairman i confirm that we're now live okay thank you um welcome to this meeting of the planning and regulatory committee the agenda papers and other relevant information for this meeting are available for public viewing on the herefordshire council website please everyone remember your words and actions should be chosen carefully and members are reminded that speeches are limited to three minutes the council is streaming this meeting live on the herefordshire council youtube channel and also making a recording the recording will be available via the council's website shortly after the meeting has concluded other attendees are permitted to film photograph and record the meeting and providing that it does not disrupt the business of this meeting if you do not wish to be filmed or photographed please identify yourself so that anyone who intends to record the meeting can be made aware <clears throat> to ensure the recording quality is maintained could members speak as clearly as possible and keep background noise to a minimum and ensure that mobile phones and other devices are turned to silent uh, so welcome to all those in attendance especially the members of the public and speakers here today i now ask Ms. Gibbons, if you could introduce officers. Thank you, Chairman. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Kelly Gibbons, um, and I am the Development Manager. Um, to my left, I have Kevin Bishop, who is the Lead Development Manager, and he's here today on his last ever planning committee with us for his retirement. Um, just joining today. Um, presenting items today have uh, item number six is Kevin Carlisle to my right. Item number seven is Andrew Banks. We also have with us today Simon Withers, um, uh, who's observing, and Jack Dyer, who is observing as well as the new planning officer who joined us recently. We also have a legal advisor to the committee is Ingrid Leite, and we have Katie Jones as the high rates officer online. Thank you. Okay, agenda item number one, apologies for absence. Apologies for absence have been received from uh, Councillor James, Councillor Johnson, and Councillor Davis. Could I just say that uh, Councillor Watson uh, is coming from Play Lane, she'll be about five minutes. On a bike? Yeah. Okay, and name substitutes? Okay, Councillor Tillett is uh, substituting for Councillor James, and Councillor Shaw is substituting for Councillor Johnson. Okay, thank you. Um, declarations of interest, agenda item number three. Please indicate if you wish to declare an interest uh, by show of hands, and I will then call each councillor in turn. No. Um, councillor Hardwick. Item six, non pecuniary. I know the applicant. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Bishop. Item number seven, non pecuniary. I know the applicant. Okay, that's lovely, thank you. And you'll be uh, leaving? I will leave the meeting. Leave the meeting, that's great, thank you. Agenda item number four, uh, the minutes, to confirm the minutes of the meeting held on the 18th of January, uh, no matters of accuracy have been notified to the uh, monitoring officer. Are the minutes of the meeting on the 18th of January approved, please? Aye. 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 Lovely, thank you. Chairman's announcement, uh, you heard Ms. Gibbons make reference to um, Mr. Bishop's, uh, I'm going to say, semi-retirement. I think uh, I will save uh, a couple of words to the end of the meeting, but I think that Herefordshire Council's loss is going to be Herefordshire Football Association's gain in quite a large way. But uh, at the end of the meeting, concluding the meeting, I will be saying a few things, and I think uh, Councillor James may be back with us then as well. And I'll also invite any members of the committee who would like to say anything at that time. But that will be at the conclusion of business. Um, moving on to the substantia, then I request the public speakers who are present uh, for agenda item number six uh, to join the meeting. I think it's Mrs. Joseph. So the applicant's agent. <coughs> Good morning to you. Um, welcome to the meeting. I'll call on you to speak following the officer presentation on this application. 
So the first application before us is Woodfields Fruit Limited, uh, Western Under Pan, Pan Yard. It's the repositioning of approved student welfare amenity block and use of the land for the standing of 59 mobile homes for seasonal workers. Associated drainage, infrastructure, landscaping and two laundry units. Um, Heather, Ms. Carlisle, over to you. Good morning and thank you Chair and also thank you to members of this committee who attended the site visit yesterday morning. This application has been redirected to planning committee by the local ward councillor, Councillor Wilding. The application site is identified in the usual manner by the Red Star. The application site is located to the north of the village of Western Under Penyard. The village of Lee lies to the south and to the east of the site is the market town of Ross on Wye. Porch farm and dairy cottages are located opposite. And Bollitree Castle and its associated buildings and Bollitree Farm are located to the southwest. Public footpaths WP22 and WP24 cross the farm, which I'll discuss in more detail later within this presentation. Next slide, please. This slide assists with visual context, and as you can see, there are currently on site 19 seasonal mobile homes which are occupied by seasonal agricultural workers. And you'll also see the existing polytunnels and the local landscape context. The host farm, known as Woodfields Farm, is an expansive farmstead comprising of mostly modern agricultural buildings. Planning permission was granted in 2012 for the change of use of land for the erection of polytunnels, as well as the siting of the aforementioned 19 residential caravans for the seasonal workers. The 19 existing caravans are located around an existing pond and on hard standing adjacent to the existing farmyard and access. This farm is part of the BH Savage Group and the farm grows apples as well as soft fruit. The farming business currently employs 270 staff at peak times across its holdings. The application site is not located within the area of outstanding natural beauty nor within a conservation area and has no listed buildings, heritage assets on or immediately adjacent to the application site. Next slide, please. This slide shows the existing site plan and the proposed site plan. The application seeks full planning permission for the proposed amenity block and the use of land for the siting of 59 mobile homes for seasonal workers. A welfare block was granted planning permission in 2020, although this permission has not been implemented and this application seeks to vary and relocate this building. In regards to the seasonal workers caravans, this involves the relocation of the 19 units already on the site and the relocation of 11 units from a nearby farm in Lee and then an additional 29 caravans on site, making a total number of 59. Members will note that this application is recommended by officers for approval. Next slide, please. The application site is not located with the A and B, and as can be seen from the submitted plan and earlier slides planned, the site is located within an established agricultural enterprise and alongside farm buildings. During the application process, amendments have been sought and secured, and it is noted a landscape visual impact assessment was submitted, as well as an additional landscape note. The site is surrounded by hedge road boundaries, which do obscure views of the existing polytunnels, and the overall effect of the Proposed mobile homes will be not notable. The mitigation measures proposed include additional hedgerows with trees and for the mobile homes on the northern edge of the site to be a suitable dark matte green colour. You'll note from the report there is no objection from the landscape or the tree officer on this proposal. This slide also helps to demonstrate the proposed tree and hedge planting across the site as well as securing the retention of the trees at the front to the site and the increased landscape buffer of planting and screening. It also shows the gravel paths. However, it is noted there are no exact details of the makeup of these gravel paths within the submission as submitted. <coughs> slide, please. This slide shows the proposed welfare building. The top plan shows the proposed location of the previously approved unit in 2020 by a yellow star. 
the welfare unit for the application currently under, under discussion is identified by the Red Star. The proposed welfare unit can be seen on this slide is now single storey and a simple unitarian form. The location of the welfare building will be screened from the entrance by tree planting and will be of a suitable scale and colour to suit the site. The photograph in the right hand, sorry, the photograph in the right top hand corner is showing the proposed sighting of the welfare block on the road access. Next slide, please. This slide, slide assists with context and background in regards to the public rights of way. There are two existing public rights of way which relate to this application site. These can be seen on the top plan, which clearly shows the existing public rights of way. They can be seen highlighted in yellow. The first one, WP24, runs east-west along the northern boundary, and also the second path is known as WP22, 20, 20, 20, and this one runs south directly across the site and into the adjacent polytunnels fields. A diversion order has been submitted by the applicant, and this is currently being reviewed by the council's proud team and the applicant is in discussion with them. The proposed diversion can be seen on the attached plan by the hatched orange line, and it can be seen that WP22 is proposed to be a rear line to the west and WP24 to the north. And again, this is demarked by the hatched line on the attached plan. The PRA diversion is covered by separate legislation, as discussed on site yesterday and noted in the committee report, the proposed site plan and the proposed conditions have been amended to reflect the fact that the diversion order has not yet been secured. The proposed site plan at the bottom of this slide with the blue arrows highlights that a number of caravans, proposed seasonal workers caravans, will not be positioned in situ until the diversion order is granted and as such the prayer route can be maintained across the site. The application site is currently served by an existing vehicle access and this is not changing. During the application process, clarification has been sought from highway colleagues in regards to transport movements and travel plan detail. Highway colleagues have not objected and there are conditions attached to the recommendation to secure a travel plan and construction management plan. Next slide. This slide gives a clear illustration of the proposed layout of the seasonal workers caravans. The applicants wish to consolidate the fruit picking, storage and packing to Woodfields Farm. Seasonal accommodation runs from May to November with the majority of workers arriving in May and remaining on site until early October. Members will note from the com committee report that the total number of occupants on site has been controlled by condition. And and that is that it's controlled at 236 and the caravans to accommodate a maximum of four people. Officers have added a temporary planning condition in regards to siting of the seasonal workers accommodation as a functional need may not be proven in the long term. In regards to ecology, the application has been supported by an ecology report and ecology colleagues have reviewed the proposal. Conditions have been added to secure both the biodiversity enhancement plan and landscaping proposals. Natural England have also confirmed acceptability of the HRA. Welsh Water has also confirmed there is capacity in the public sewage network and a drainage condition has been added in respect to surface water drainage. Next slide, please. This slide and the one next are primarily for the benefit of members who did not attend the site meeting yesterday. They assist and demonstrate the context of the immediate area. The photographs show the existing site and show um, photographs are submitted in the landscape appraisal. So in the existing seasonal workers caravans on site, road frontage and the public right of way along the northern front. Next slide please. This slide shows some of the existing caravans around the site and the left hand photo shows the area where the proposed caravans will be sited. Again this slide is to, to assist in context. Next slide please. This slide demonstrates the close proximity to the neighbouring properties and they can be seen within the, within the blue oval shape on the, on the slide. Noise and residential immunity is a key issue and consideration. Members who attended the site visit yesterday heard from the Ward Councillor and his concerns in regards to the impact on neighbour immunity and in particular from noise nuisance, including antisocial behaviour generated from the presence of the seasonal workers in the area. 
Following on from discussions on site yesterday, can I make members aware and again remind members that the applicants have submitted a detailed noise management plan and within this the applicants have listed contact numbers for out of hours contact for the staff at the farm as well as a comprehensive list of restrictions for workers staying on site. Amenity has also been addressed in detail within 6.59 to 6.65 of the committee report. And as highlighted within the report, it is acknowledged that there is potential for the immediate <coughs> area of population to be increased due to the number of people living on the site. And this is a concern as evidenced by the letters of representation, especially with regards to noise and disturbance. As detailed in the report, occupants of the proposed accommodation are subject to the management and control of their employer. However, officers are confident that this impact in terms of noise and other disturbances can be appropriately controlled through the site management noise plan. An appropriate condition is duly recommended to, to secure the adherence to such a plan. Also, environmental health colleagues have confirmed, confirmed no objection. Can we move to the final and next slide, please? <coughs> The environmental impact of the scheme has been assessed and it's considered to be appropriately controlled and mitigated with the biodiversity net gain enhancements. The drainage scheme put forward for both, for both surface water and foul water is acceptable and has been assessed in terms of impact to the riverwise sack. The proposal will support the ongoing farming activities as both the holding sorry, as part of the holding by providing community amenity space and accommodation for seasonal workers. In regards to the public right of way, the applicant will need to obtain separate consent to, divide, to divert the public footpaths in order for any approval to be implemented fully. As referenced in both the committee report and earlier, the use of the site has clearly caused some concern from residents, as, it, as is evident by the public representation received on this application. However, the proposed building will provide indoor amenity area and that will reduce the need for seasonal workers to gather outdoors and there, therefore, sorry, thereby reduce the noise of, level of noise emanating from the site. The purpose of the building is to provide such a space and the siting of the building is such that it will move any associated activities away from site boundaries. As detailed, a noise management plan has been submitted and there is a condition attached to it. Accordingly, having regard to all of the above, the application is recommended for approval, along with conditions proposed as detailed in the committee report. Thank you, Chair, and this brings concludes my presentation. Thank you very much, Ms. Carlisle. <coughs> uh, we now move on to speakers. I think we'll go to Mrs. Joseph to start with, if that's all right with you, because the other two. I'll go, we'll go to the local member first, is it? No, no, sorry, no. I just need to move the camera. Oh, right, okay, sorry, I'm going to say that's not what I've got. It's going to rotate so that you get on. What happened to the automatic one? <coughs> this is Joseph when you're ready. Thank you. Good morning. Woodfields Fruit Limited is part of a local farming business which has been operating at both Western and Penn Yard and Lee for over 50 years by the Savage family, who are well regarded <coughs> in the area. It is a testament to their farming operation that the proposal has led to only five letters of concern from local residents, and such a proposal would normally generate difficult local opposition. Woodfields is at the heart of the fruit picking operation, where the majority of the fruit is grown. All packaging and storage takes place at Woodfield, and it is important to stress that there will be no increase in the packaging and delivery movements to and from the site, and as such, no increase in HGVs or tractor movements. The application simply seeks to consolidate the location of the seasonal workers on the site. It is proposed to reposition some of the existing units away from dairy farm cottages and relocate the units from Mock, 11 units from Mock Farm. So essentially there is a proposed net increase of 29 units. Workers are currently brought to the site in the morning by minibuses when their jobs are allocated. By consolidating all the workers' accommodation on the site, there will be a net decrease in vehicle movements and your highway officers are satisfied that there will be no detrimental impact on highway safety. Since the pandemic and Brexit, there have been difficulties in accessing a suitable labour market for fruit picking, and it has become important to provide improved facilities for seasonal workers to ensure their retention. 
Many workers return to Woodfield year after year, providing sufficient and suitable accommodation for staff is fundamental to ensuring the long-term stability of the business. As part of the application, we are proposing a welfare building, as discussed, which allows for internal leisure facilities for the staff, plus a specific outdoor barbecue area located at the furthest point away from any residential properties. Throughout the process, the applicants have worked with your officers to ensure that any concerns from statutory consultees, the parish council and local residents have been addressed, introducing a noise management plan and providing a 24 hour number where residents can raise any concerns. The applicants have acted quickly to any previous complaints, for example, banning the use of any speakers on the farm and prohibiting music outside after 10 pm. They have submitted a noise management plan and are happy to submit a review on a regular basis. As a result, there are no objections from your statutory consultees. As stated by the officer, we are happy to agree to not locate the mobile homes along the route of the prow until such times as the, the diversion order has been determined. The clients have been working with the parish council's footpath officer to ensure that they are satisfied that the current route of the prow is accessible. This proposal will support not only the rural economy, but it, it complies with planning policy and will help help ensure the survival of sustainable farming business producing food for the UK market. We hope you feel able to support the application in accordance with your officer's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Joseph. Excellent timing there for two minutes and 55 seconds. May I ask you to return to the public gallery, please? <clears throat> we will now hear from uh, a statement has been provided by Western Under Penyard Parish Council. Uh, Matt, if you could. Okay, great. So the read on behalf of the, the local parish council. Um, there are two major issues that the parish council wishes to raise. The red line is drawn around the application site. Confining the red line to a two hectare site gives a misleading imprint of the extent of the historic usurpation of the two public rights of way, WP22 and WP24, that cross both the development site and the adjoining 4.5 hectare field. Both sites are under the ownership and control of the applicant. The adjoining field is entirely covered by polytunnels, consent for which was given by planning consent S100874 slash F. 19 conditions were attached to that consent. Condition 15 stated, quotes, no polytunnel shall be erected within two metres of the centre line of the public footpaths WP22 and WP24, end quotes. There is no evidence that condition 15 has been observed and both WP22 and WP24 have been severely obstructed for some years. The aerial photograph in the officer's report shows body tunnels covering the whole of the 4.5 hectare field. The applicant has been in breach of his planning consent for 10 years and remains in breach to this day. It is noted that work has been done in the past week or so to peel back the rolled up covers and prop them up with poles and clear the paths, possibly in anticipation of the site visit on 7th of February. This is the first time any attempt has been made by the applicant to keep open the public right of way. The report states that, open quotes, granting of planning permission does not override legislation. As such, it is not considered that this would be a sustainable reason to refuse this application, end quotes. We disagree for the following reasons. One, the applicant is in breach of a consent S100874F granted in 2012. Two, despite efforts of parish residents, parish council, ramblers and other groups, the usurpation of WP22 and WP24 remains unresolved. Three, the parish council can find no evidence that an application to reroute the footpath has been made. Four, were the planning committee to approve this application, another 10 <coughs> years might pass with the public rights of ways continuing to be obstructed and no application made for rerouting. The Parish Council has no objection to WP22 and WP24 being rerouted to a mutually agreed location, together with the appropriate signage gates and markers, but this should happen before any permission is given. Western Under Penyard Neighbourhood Development Plan was adopted in May 2016 and Herefordshire Council's core strategy was adopted in October 2015. The committee will know that the most recently adopted plan takes precedence. There, thus, the officer should not disregard the representations made by the Parish Council. In particular, A, a development of 59 homes accommodating between 236 and 354 people would normally require a substantial Section 106 agreement. These mobile homes are outside the Western Village settlement boundary, but the impact 
Okay, the th three minutes up, I'm afraid that there's a, a small amount more on the statement, but um, we'll move on to the, uh, the next statement, please, which has been provided by Mrs. Reynolds, a local resident in objection to the application. Mr. Evans, if you could read that one. I live at two dairy cottages and wish to express my concerns regarding the workers at the fruit farm opposite and the plans for expansion. Last summer, in particular, the volume and frequency of unacceptable noise from these workers was extremely upsetting, particularly in the evenings and late into the early hours of the morning. Shouting, shrieking, piercing whistles, cheering, very loud music and general raucous partying <clears throat> seriously impacted my sleep, peace and general health. An increase in numbers plus associated noise, traffic, littering on public highways, danger from fires and barbecues, etc., without effective on-site management can only negatively impact my mental and physical health to an even greater degree. I bought this property for its quiet and peaceful surroundings and unfortunately that is increasingly not what I am able to enjoy. Right, thank you. Um, we now move over to the uh, ward member. Councillor Wilding is the ward member. He speaks first and then he has the right to speak again at the end of the de debate. He does not, however, have a vote. Uh, Councillor Wilding, 10 minutes. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Um, thanks to everyone for attending yesterday's site visit. I believe there are four major hurdles that this application must get over in order to be acceptable. One, the prowl situation. Two, the nuisance caused to local residents. Three, the sewage. And four, the roads and traffic. I recognise that the applicant has made quite a few changes along with our planning department and I thank them for, for that. And I don't want you to refuse this application. I want to encourage the business, it's a good business. But I also don't want you to grant it as it is. I'd like you to defer this application to allow extra time for the applicant with help from the planning teams to improve it. The aim being to balance the needs of the applicant with the needs of the local residents. Because at the moment, I believe their rights are seriously impinged by this development. I don't think the application is compliant with SD1, um, which, uh, for instance, suggests that, uh, let me just have a look at the local plan here. Uh, new development does not contribute to adverse impacts arising from noise or cause groundwater pollution. Quality of life for existing residents can be adversely affected by insensitive, poorly considered design and environments that minimise opportunities and antisocial behaviour by incorporating um, design principles. So that's the, the sort of thing. I mean, there's loads more, but I, I won't read it all. So back to my list of hurdles. Uh, the Prowl situation, you've heard from Western Under Penyard Parish Council um, that they say that existing Prowls have been obstructed for 10 years. I pointed that out to members on the site yesterday, so you actually saw that. The Parish Council say that until a few days ago, uh, that situation was worse, but it's been cleaned up. They also make it clear that footpaths have been obstructed for years and they therefore believe that ongoing access to footpaths, if you grant this application, will be further frustrated. And they want to see the footpaths fully rerouted before the commencement of any works. Nuisance caused to local residents, uh, residents of dairy cottages, and I know there was only four or so, uh, but I, there are only 15 cottages. Uh, so that's quite a, a large amount of them. And I know from having spoken and gone round, there's at least eight of them have spoken to me and pointed all these things out. Complaints made to me during the summer season are that there is loud, rowdy behaviour uh, as a regular occurrence and shouting and laughing, as you'd heard. I welcome the measures that are going to be uh, are trying to control these problems. Uh, in the noise management uh, that's been proposed, but I do not think they go far enough. And I'd like to see some more safeguards put in place. 
uh, the welfare block, uh, pretending to move that by about 10 foot uh, in order to reduce the noise. I don't believe that's going to reduce the noise. And I think it should be at a greater distance from dairy cottages. And looking at it yesterday, the members will know there was quite a lot of space and it could have been moved further away. Uh, I think this is a failure of our planning department for not fully appreciating the residents' situation. Um, so I'd like to see uh, some thought to that given. I also pointed out yesterday that the welfare block itself is not very large. It's not very large and it will accommodate uh, it won't go anywhere near accommodating the larger amount of workers. The block will also be non-smoking, so again, workers will gather outside. I remind you that there are 236 workers, and that block is about the size of this square table, or what we're sitting around now. 236 workers is an increase of 156 workers. They're already complaining that the workers on site are making noise and we're going to be giving them another 156. It's not true that there are only 29 more um, caravans. There are going to be 40 more caravans. <coughs> I also raised the question about the green buffer aero area, uh, which I think is fantastic around the pond with the tree planting associated landscaping. It's all very well, but it's next to the welfare block. And I would think that rather than acting as a noise buffer, uh, that area is just going to be a major draw for workers to gather in the summer. I should also like to see some specific, so sorry, I would like to see some specific measures to prevent that from happening. The site plan shows a dedicated seating area, barbecue area at the far end of the site. That's great, but I don't think it's big enough. I'd like to see it enlarged, made more welcoming, including some undercover areas so that it is a natural place for people to gather and take them further away from dairy cottages. The noise management plan itself, again, I think it's a great thing that it's coming in, but it needs to be tightened up. For instance, it says things like, no loud singing after 10 p.m. Well, I'd like to see that change to no singing, not no loud, no singing, because soft singing leads to loud singing, especially if you've had a glass of Chardonnay. No loud speakers, it says no loud speakers. Well, it's not the size of a speaker that counts, it's the volume of sound it makes. So I'd like to see better definitions there. Uh, site noise monitoring. monitoring. Uh, can we have a more detailed breakdown of how this will work with information on how decisions are made by the monitors? Who or what deems whether noise levels are unreasonably high? The out of hours noise monitoring, out of hours contact, again, brilliant, but how confident can we be that there will always be a member of staff to deal with complaints in a timely manner? And by that, I mean more or less immediately because we're talking about people complaining of noise at one in the morning when their children want to get up to go to school the next day. Sewerage, all the residents I've talked to have actually put the smell of sewerage above the noise levels as their number one complaint. So I know in the report, uh, West, uh, Welsh Water say things that they can cope, but the residents say they can't cope now. And we're talking about another 150 people all using the amenities at least once a day. The roads and traffic, uh, members noted the terrible state of the road just outside the entrance. Um, and uh, I would like to see something in, in, the, in the plan to get the applicant to improve that. Because one of the other problems residents know is that uh, vehicles going in and out the entrance cause a lot of dust, which floats over the, uh, over the um, dairy cottages. So to sum up, at the moment, it does not appear that existing pros, welfare of our residents 
are taken seriously enough. The whole design could be a better, higher standard. That's why I suggest you could defer this application. I want this business to thrive and to expand, but it must be done in a way that respects the residents. I don't want the application refused because the situation as it is, is not good. And this would improve it with the improvements I'm suggesting. So those moan points again, footpaths fully rerouted before work start. Consider moving the welfare block further away. Measures to prevent the buffer zone from becoming a gathering zone. Enlargement, improvement of the proposed outdoor seating. Site noise monitoring and phone line with penalties for non-compliance. I'd like to see some way that we could actually give that some beef. Better plan for the sewage and wastewater. And lastly, free on-site bicycles for workers uh, that they could use, and the development of some cycle routes leading towards Ross. Uh, road and site entrance repairs to compensate for heavy site traffic. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wilding. Uh, before I move to members and invite debate, I will just return to the planning officer, Miss Carlisle. Thank you, Chair. Um, just as a point of clarity, and, and so uh, members aren't uh, misinformed as part of the discussion, um, in respect to the uh, public right of way um, diversion order, just to clarify that the public right of way officer has actually confirmed, just to make sure that you're using the right language, is that it's actually a pre order consultation has been submitted under the Highway Act. Um, it's not, it, they actually haven't submitted the formal. Um, public right of way um, sort of diversion order. So, just to clarify, um, in terms of the use of the language in, in that respect, um, and just to clarify, in terms of the, in terms of that, um, in, in terms of the pre order consultation that is shared with the local ward councillor and the parish council, and they have um, been sort of liaising with, um, with with the public rights of way team in in that regard. Okay, thank you. Um, members of the Planning Committee, I now invite debate. Do I have any speakers? <coughs> Councillor Norman. Thank you, Chair. And um, first of all, I'm sorry I wasn't able to be at the site visit. It really would be very helpful to have been there, but it clashed with another meeting. Um, but I think the picture of the situation we're looking at has been very clearly outlined, um, particularly by the local member. Um, there's obviously a clash of interests here, local people and their well-being and their amenity versus the application, the need to expand, and the well-being of the workers themselves. Um, if we have something too rigid and restrictive, that's not great for them either, although it's clearly necessary to have some rules in place uh, for local people. Um, it, it seems as things that could have been done where the um, where the immunity block is placed. It appears, from what I hear, that this could have been better cited to minimise impact uh, on the public right of way. The crowd can't understand why that hasn't been in at least the application in already. Um, and things like travel plan and so on. We thought that would be uh, something that could all have been done ahead of time. Um, I, for me, the suggestion of a of a of a, of a, of a, um, a delay to get some of this right makes sense. Um, there's obviously real problems that could be sorted. If the members made it clear he wants to see something go ahead, but it needs to be done in a way that's going to minimise the impact on local people and <laughs> in everyone's interest. So I would be prepared to um, propose um, the term a delay. Um, Deferment. Deferment. A deferment, thank you. Or a deferral. Deferral. I'd be happy to propose that. Right. Um, so that's been proposed. Seconded. Uh, seconded by Councillor Bowen, but I'm going to carry on with the debate, see if we can open up uh, a little bit more uh, knowledge and opinions on this. Councillor Shaw. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, I've uh, got a uh, 
a couple of questions for the, the planning officer who might be able to help me on this. Um, <clears throat> obviously, the site's been operating as it has for a number of years. Um, and I was just wondering if she's aware of any complaints received by our environmental health department in terms of noise um, over that period of time, whether, whether this site has got a, a history of raucous behaviour or, or in fact whether um, no or few complaints have been received about, about it. I, I'd like to, her to answer that. Um, if she could also explain a little bit more for the committee, um, if she knows about the process for applying for Prow diversion, because I'd imagine the first part of that process is to go for consultation before you can even apply to the committee <coughs> for a diversion order. So I, I'd like to understand that. Um, and in terms of the noise management um, documents, um, I'm conscious that if the planning committee give consent uh, for the application, then um, to a certain extent, our ability or, or the ability of the authority to, uh, uh, to, to rule on matters of, of whether something breaches the noise management um, is a little bit, um, well, I'm not sure what, what, what authority we have. Effectively, we can't take away consent because because of the is it a breach of the condition um, and do we attack it through that or do we do we have to rely upon um, uh, environmental protection <coughs> enforcement of noise regulations? I, I'm uncertain about that. Um, so those are the areas I'd like to understand better. I'd also like to understand um, whether we can give a, uh, I note that there, there is a, uh, a term restriction already, term condition on the document. Um, it would seem to me that in order to prove that the noise management can be catered for by the management of the site, to give a conditional consent for say five years, um, might be prudent in that if a lot of complaints are received then at the end of the five years the, the consent for the site is is removed but the applicant can reapply any time during that five years for for full consent um, so a whole number of questions over to you Ms. Carlisle. Um, thank you Councillor. Um, is it chair is it all right if i answer Councillor Norman's questions first. Yes, absolutely, as you see fit. Yeah. Welcome to um, Councillor Shores. Um, thank you, um, Councillor Norman, for your questions. Just to clarify, in respect of you made comments about the proposed um, welfare block, the positioning and the siting was amended during the application process for this current application following advice from um, the landscape officers. And again, it was reduced in, in, in size and in terms of materials. Also, I think it's important to note and to clarify that the applicant actually has got a fallback position because they've actually got a live consent for the existing, um, for the sort of the previously two-story welfare block that was shown on slide five, which they could still implement. And also as a caveat, that permission has not got any conditions attached to it controlling noise management plan. So in respect of this application, this is a more robust um, application in respect of having a detailed noise management plan. So that's just a bit of a, I suppose, in terms of um, a rebuttal point. It's a real question. Um, thank you, Councillor Shaw, in terms of um, your questions. Um, in you might just need to sort of just help me or just uh, remind me in terms of just to make sure that uh, I've covered all the areas. Um, in, in terms of, uh, let me just go through them. In terms of the, in terms of the site history, um, that, that was in respect to environmental health. Um, I, am, I am aware of the site history and in terms of complaints, that was raised as part of the consultation with the, the designated environmental health officers and that then influenced in terms of during the application process a more robust um, noise management plan 
was um, sort of requested by the, um, the environmental health officer and in terms of the, um, in terms of it, again, it's the language and in terms of the, the restrictions applied to that. Again, in respect to the noise management plan, just so you're aware, that has been worded that A, that it can be reviewed um, on a regular basis and it can be amended to take into account um, as potential sort of items that are flagged on site um, you know, to allow, to allow de dedicated environmental officers to, um, to, to review it and, and adapt it. Um, in, respect to in respect to your final question, in respect to compliance, then yes, that there would be a if we did it, yes, it would be a breach of condition, but again, there is the ability within that condition to amend and update the noise management plan to, to, to um, address concerns from local residents, wall councillors, and uh, you know, sort of commentary from, from the technical environmental health officers. Um, in respect to the, the proud process, um, that is, as I said, the, the application is submitted under the Highways Act. That doesn't fall under sort of my remit in the, in the local planning authority under the Town and Country Planning Act. But you're right in terms of like what in terms of the clarification that I just made is that my understanding, is, like you say, is there is this pre order goes in and then there's a formal process. But it, it is within the it's, it's similar to planning, it is within the public domain. Um, and um, all councillors, local residents can provide commentary on that. Uh, have you had all your questions? I, 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 there, I think I. There's a question about te about a temporary. Um, uh, yes. I, I think I think in, t in terms of the, I suppose in, in, in terms of the um, temporary consent, um, I, I think that would probably need to involve discussions with the um, in, in terms of the applicant and their agent whether or not in terms of a five year is it is is reasonable in, in terms of the works that need to be, that need to be. Um, you know, undertaken for the construction of that building. So um, I, I think that, as I say, that the, the recommendation is for officers can, sub, you know, subject to approval, can sort of amend conditions. But um, I hope that assists. Um, well, I suppose it puts the onus back on the committee um, because if the committee considers that, a, that, that, that limiting the consent is what the committee wants to do. Um, but it's up to the applicant to appeal that condition. Um, so, uh, Chair, I'd like to table uh, a motion to approve the application subject to five years. Okay, I've got I've got a proposal at the moment, which is for deferral. We will carry on with the debate. We will um, see how the vote goes on uh, the proposal by Councillor Norman. And then we'll take it from there. And if necessary, Councillor Shaw, we will come back to you. you. So I'm looking for further contributions to the debate. Uh, Councillor Probert. Okay, so right in the middle, you've got two lovely laundry rooms which look the same size as the power bands. I believe you said yesterday that we actually just going to be um, a washing line and then a little shed. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, so we're going to have a little shed on site with a little shed that I saw that we accommodated double mattress that was jumping in there. So that's probably going to take one washing machine. So two washing machines for 236 people. Doesn't look very adequate. Yeah, yes, please. Um, thank you, um, Councillor Prober. In, in respect to the laundry facilities, um, apologies, I didn't um, sort of identify on site, but in terms of where we were standing for the, for the members who were on site yesterday, where there's an existing um, sort of agricultural building, uh, which was behind where the proposed new welfare building, there was actually washing machines um, within that building, and sort of in terms of washing facilities within that building at present, which are for the existing um, 19 caravans on site. And for, um, from my understanding is that in terms of the welfare unit, the, it hasn't been decided yet whether or not additional um, washing machines are going to be included in the, in the proposed new welfare building. However, there is capacity on site already for um, for washing facilities. It's not to clarify. It's not within, as I say, the, the, the structures on the site. That is purely, um, as I say, for for, for washing lines. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any further speakers? Councillor Bowen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do have some concerns about the sewerage network. Uh, we know the Welsh Water almost always says, oh, everything's wonderful, it's no problem at all, when you know perfectly well there are, shall we say, 
terminologically challenged in their statement. And we have seen many examples of where their, their assertions that everything is well are actually unfounded. And I'm concerned about both the sewerage and the water supply. Can we have some further clarification on that, please? Ms. Carlisle. Thank you, uh, thank you, Councillor Bowen. Um, I can say that in terms of the, the Welsh the Welsh water um, comments in respect to foul sewerage, as part of the into the planning history and the planning representation, the Welsh water um, statutory consultees initially did submit a holding objection. However, further further discussions with, from the um, from the planning agent and the local planning authority, they removed their objection because they needed clarification in terms of um, using a pumping sort of station in terms of how the, the foul sewage would work. I think what, all I can say to you, Councillor Boeing, is they are the statutory technical consultees, um, and as I say, they've raised no objection. They've also said that there's, they've raised no objection in terms of water supply as well, because this site has got its own um, borehole provision. Thank you. Um, what, what about the complaints of smell? stink and general unpleasantness from the sewage system currently? I can't necessarily sort of comment on that. I mean, I, I think in terms of the, with it going through the, the foul sewage system, I would probably, in my opinion, would be there'd be a betterment because it's now going in terms of it's going through the, the, um, into sort of the public sewage system. Well, I hope the public sewage system can cope with this. And it does, I'm not, I don't, as I said, I have no great certainty that Welsh Water always has a really true appreciation of the situation locally and on or under the ground. And so I do have concerns about this. I, I, I think, uh, uh, Councillor Boyle, we have to take Welsh Water's professional opinion as is. We're very uh, brave, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm sure all members have read uh, at the end of the. Um, document <clears throat> the recommendation and the substantive conditions there's page after page after page so th there was a lot of things in here that we would automatically think to question that have been answered um, with conditions so please bear those the, uh, those um, conditions in mind with your uh, decision making but are there any more questions I was like we've got councillor Andrews and then we'll take councillor Tillett and sorry, we've got Polly Andrews and then Councillor Mill. <coughs> oh, thank you, Chairman. I mean, this is a working business which we would, would, like, would like to see supported as the Ward Councillor does. It seems to me that the major problem that's been expressed is the noise and disturbance caused by the often young pickers, I think they're often young men, who are obviously want to enjoy themselves when their working day has ended. I know that uh, Mrs Carlyle has said that the existing welfare hub has already got a planning permission, but the movement seems to be, of moving it seems to be very limited. I understand there's a barbecue site at the back of the site. Surely it would make sense to put the barbecue site and the welfare hub all together right at the back of the site, which would take it well away from dairy cottages. Is that possible, or am I speaking out of uh, I would imagine, uh, Ms Carlyle, if you want to add to that, but I would imagine that would come under the, uh, if the committee sees fit to make a deferral to yes. this. But Ms Carlyle, mm. did you want to add to that? I, I agree that that, that, would, that would be a, you know, a new application and there'd be new material planning considerations to take into account in, in respect to... It, it seems to be stuff. a great pity that that was not thought of, that the two things should be together, well away from the, the uh, dairy <coughs> cottages. <coughs> Councillor Tillett. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I just, perhaps Ms Carlyle can just clarify something that I, I'm not 100% clear on. Uh, with regards to uh, condition six, uh, going back to the public right of way issue, um, prior to occupation and while awaiting the diversion, the caravan shall be cited as shown on 1418.1 uh, revised B proposed site plan, um, which seems to me to be the, the citing that the applicant wants. 
and yet that, that we're, we're saying that 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 can go um, ahead before the the the, the, the pro diversion. Um, is, 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 are we not putting the horse before the cart, or have I got hold of the wrong end of the stick? In terms of, sorry to interject. In terms of in terms of that um, condition, it was to allow it was it was to allow the, the development to to go ahead. And in terms of as I say, it's this certain caravans <coughs> couldn't be put in place um, while the, the, the diversion order was in place, so so the, the public right of way could go across the site. Um, I think um, it's also linked then to there's also a phasing plan as well, which again could be combined in terms of whether or not that could be linked. But but I, I agree with in terms of what you're saying. It's it's trying to it's it's because the the, the public right the public right of way is under a different in terms of the Highway Act. It's it's trying to I suppose in terms of to to make this application um, acceptable um, while the discussions are going on with the um, with the public. In, in the sense that your hands are slightly tied in what you can and can't uh, put a, as, as, a, as a condition in, because they're two slightly different fields? Well, I've got no, yeah. as, as, for example, the local planning authority, I, I've got no jurisdiction control in terms of the, in terms of the diversion order. So, so, it, so it could not be made an absolute condition that this could not go ahead until the diversion order had been made, or that it would be unrealistic or unfair. I think it. Sorry, I think you're right. It'd be deemed to be un, unreasonable. Well, in my opinion, it's whether it'd be deemed to be sort of unreasonable. But I'd maybe let. Um, no, I, I think a condition in that sort would be unreasonable. But essentially, the condition um, is that the public right of way. Well, if we added a condition to say the public right of way had to remain open, that that would be fine. But that's still covered by other legislation. They can't. This, pub, this planning permission wouldn't override the public rights of way legislation that said it shouldn't be obstructed. So um, there are, I think, identified on the plan, I've done look, three or four caravans that would be on the actual route. So the rest of the caravans would be put in, except for those four, because they would effectively block the route, obstruct the route. So um, if that diversion orders then confirmed, that's the right terminology, confirmed, they could then go ahead and put the remaining caravans in. Does that make sense? But our, if we put a condition on, it wouldn't override another piece of legislation anyway. Okay, thank so, you. Okay, yeah. lovely, thank you. Councillor Mill? Uh, yes, thank you. This is one of those applications where um, we're asked, I think, as members to exercise a lot of good faith where the performance of the planning is in the, in the promise. Uh, and very much in uh, the enforceability and effectiveness of the numerous conditions, the 23 conditions. Um, and uh, looking too much at the past uh, gives us misgivings. I mean, it is disappointing to read the objections from the uh, parish council and the Open Spaces Society about the treatment of the, of the, uh, by the applicants of the PRO over the last 10 years. And you, and you do tend to think, well, uh, does this give us good faith on their uh, genuineness to work with us to ensure that the active travel measures through the site are, 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 are preserved? I mean, if it were me, I would be enhancing them, of course. But uh, that, that is not the attitude of the applicant. Um, and it's it's uh, a commercial operation i fully understand that and uh, the the the, the, um, the underlying drivers of uh, of the business are, are 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 not quite are not necessarily to promote active travel but um it, it, it's uh, it's a good point and the wood councillor has made that too uh, we would we would love to see that better promoted um, the other other uh, unrelated point I, I'd like to make is, and that is one of appreciation, that working with our landscape officer, they have beefed up the landscaping, particularly on the, um, on, on the uh, east side of the site, uh, and, that, and that is appreciated. I did notice on the site meeting yesterday, uh, although the tree officer uh, didn't, 
uh, or doesn't appear to have commented on them, that rather fine statuesque group of Pinus sylvestris, which, it, it, uh, which is not identified in the planting plan, and it would be reassuring that to uh, have them, I don't know, group TPO'd or something, if that's possible. So whether that, whether they can be, I don't know, um, mentioned in a condition or something, that would be, uh, that would make a difference for me. Thank you, Chad. Thank you, Councillor Mill. Ms Carlyle, did you have anything to? Uh, nothing further to add, but obviously note in terms of the, the, the request of Councillor Mill in terms of amending um, a condition of members of my district run certain Okay, thank you. <clears throat> it does, do we have any more further speakers? No, okay, we have... Mr. Chairman, as well. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Okay. Uh, the show. I didn't see your little hand up there. Sorry, Chair. It, with your um, consent, I'd, I'd like to ask a further question. Yes, absolutely. Uh, um, of the planning officer. Um, is the planning officer aware whether the parish council or the ward councillor or any other person has raised an issue of obstruction with Highways Authority about this sort of plan? Um, it is not. It's, it's, it hasn't been. It has been shared with me. Thank you. Can I follow that one up with if one of the statutory consultees that have replied uh, would they have the knowledge? If there had been a complaint, so the footpaths officer, did we have any reply of them? The, the footpaths officer, they, <coughs> as part of the um, the consultees, they have a, they have objected, listed, yeah. which is listed within within the report. Okay, yeah, um, I've I've seen that, but was part of their objection based on complaints that they had received from potential users of the footpath? Or I, do, we, I, we don't know. That. I don't have the background. <coughs> okay, no problem. So we've got no further speakers. No, uh, I'm going to go first of all then, uh, we've got a proposal on the table, I'm going to go first of all to our, uh, our officers. Uh, Ms Gibbons, we'll start with you, did you want to make any comments? No, I think the only comment would be the if there is a request for deferral, whether or not there would be a consideration to defer that matter, to reconsider the, or to review the noise conditions um, back to, but back to officers rather than returning to our team, <coughs> given the comments that have been made. A delegated, a delegated decision. decision. All right. I, I, am, I am concerned, before we speak to our legal officer, I am concerned that with the deferral, uh, and we live in an agricultural county, and we do have a big issue of food security, and for us to do, uh, maybe defer this decision when we've got a substantial document in front of us, you know, it's, not a, it's not a deferral for an extension to a house that has got no time limit agriculture, food, um, the apples aren't going to stop growing, the, the soft fruit isn't going to stop growing. And if this isn't in place, there is a concern that maybe, you know, it, it, it does make the business not viable. But we do have a proposal. Um, legal officer, would you like to say anything? No. No, okay. We have a proposal on the table. This is for deferral. It's proposed by Councillor Norman, seconded by Councillor Bowen. Um, I would come back to you, uh, Councillor Wilding. Have you got anything to add before we have this vote? Just, just briefly, thank you, Chair. Um, just commenting on some of the things that have been said. Could you hold on just one moment, please, Councillor Wilding? We're going to turn the camera around to get okay. the best angle. Ready for my close up. Right. Thank you, Councillor Wilder. Um, yeah, so uh, just a few comments on, on what have been said. Uh, the welfare block, um, uh, uh, talking about the past application to grant it to be built. Um, and that that's one of the reasons I don't want to refer, uh, to refuse this application. And I do want everything to work, but of course the previous permission uh, to grant the welfare block did not include the 40 extra caravans. Um, and that is the real object of this application in, and, and we want to support that. So, you know, we don't want to revert to that other one, we, we want to support this. Um, talking about the sewage. I have been told, but this is only things people have told me, <clears throat> that environmental health had been uh, visited the site in the past because of overflowing sewage. 
And um, I do echo what's been said that can the public sewer system actually cope with this increased number? In terms of the pro, the current suggestion that we've got before us is to let the pro go through the middle of the caravans, to leave a few caravans out. But can you imagine a group of ramblers coming along through the open countryside and then walking in between these um, caravans? That's not something they'll want to do, is it? And, and it might go on for a long time. Is it not possible to temporarily divert the probe around the edge of the site rather than it going through the middle of the site. Councilor that... Wilding, this was summing up. Okay, thanks, that's it. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Um, could I go to you, Councillor Norman, and before we have the vote, uh, would your proposal for deferral also include uh, delegating the decision to officers? In, cons in no, consultation no. with well, in consultation. Yes. okay uh is that all right with you as well uh councillor bowie uh, thank you mr chairman yes. okay lovely thank you in that case then a proposal for deferral uh all those in favor of deferral one two all those against deferral one two Six, seven, eight, nine. And abstentions. Right, members of the committee, I'm looking for further proposals. And I think Councillor Shaw, you indicated that you had one. Uh, yes, Chair. Uh, the um, my uh, proposal was to um, accept uh, was to uh, accept approval of this application. Um, subject to those conditions outlined, um, subject to any other conditions <coughs> any other member of the committee wants to add, um, and uh, but for a period of five years. All right, um, Ms. Carlisle, are we uh, quite clear on what those um, recommendations or suggestions from Councillor Shaw were? Um, and if not, we can get Councillor Shaw to. Ms. Gibbons has got the machine. I believe that there, were, there was a condition that you spoke about. So for, at the moment, for the, it's a temporary provision for 25 years. 25 just years. Just five. Five, yeah. On, yeah. on that, the reason for that would be purely on um, noise mitigation. On, on noise mitigation, to give the, the applicant the opportunity to demonstrate <coughs> beyond reasonable doubt that they can manage the enforcement of their noise management plan. I think in terms of whether or not that condition is reasonable, I raise, raise this now, is that in terms of future planning and forward planning for the business, a five year period of knowing, obviously with a growing period, is a very short amount of time, hence we went for the longer growing period, the longer period before. Acknowledging the reason for the condition is purely on that noise ground, um, and acknowledging as well that that condition in terms of the noise management plan does allow those reviews so that if there are complaints and there is a, a way to react to those and to work with the applicants to do that so um i think the five years is probably i remember to take this into account is five years is probably an unreasonable amount of time in terms of a business perspective for five years and i think you know we can look at maybe ways of tightening up the noise management plan to make sure there's more regular reviews and contact within that potentially um, but yeah it, that's that's the comments i would make on the, the five-year period but if that's your proposal i just but, just uh, with I, that in mind council sure um with that in mind um uh, i'm hesitant to 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 alter it um principally because uh it then relies on planning enforcement and our environmental health yeah. teams to effectively police this noise management. And um, I have to, you know, I have eight years of experience of that going on within the county. Um, and unless it's, um, it's unless it's on the footsteps of Plough Lane or the county hall, um, I'm afraid 
you know, we have a very small team that's, that's, that's um, stretched um, in all directions. Um, I think it's up to the applicant. If the applicant feels that this will be an unfair condition to appeal it um, and, and let the planning inspector decide whether it's unfair or not. And, um, I just think we, unless another you know, if my if my if this um, proposal fails, um, then I'll listen to any other um, proposal that's put forward. Okay, so Councillor Shaw is proposing then, and Miss Gibbons, if you can correct me if I'm wrong, that we accept the application as per the officer's recommendation, but in, uh, with a five-year review. That means that in five years' time, a further application, planning application, would have to come in. To then look for a longer period of time. Were there any other conditions? Um, I'm not aware of any, but if if uh, any member of the committee brought forward conditions that they wanted Can, to, Councillor Mill, one about the trees. Yes, 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 if that was that's perfectly acceptable as well, is it? Okay, so we have a, a proposal from Councillor Shaw to accept as per officer's recommendations with with the conditions that it's for a five-year license. Is license the correct word to use that? No? Five a five-year five -year temporary permission, and also a group TPO on the- On the, on the uh, Scots. On the Scots. Uh, no, I, don't just, TPO. Sorry, I, don't think, I don't think we agreed to- No, 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 sorry, what was it then? Change of social Right. What was it? In terms of in terms of retention of those. Of those yes. Of those oh, right. Okay. Sorry, I did. Right. Sorry, Councillor Mel. I think I upscaled your uh, idea a little bit. Right. Uh, would anybody like to second this proposal, Councillor Andrews? Uh, Miss Gibbons, did you want to add anything before I move on to the vote? Okay. Proposed by Councillor Shaw, seconded by Councillor Andrews, uh, for accepting the conditions you've heard. All those in favour? One, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, ten. ten, ten, ten. All those against? Any abstentions? That has been carried. Thank you very much, everybody. That was a great debate. We enjoyed everything. Uh, now we go on to the next application. Uh, is it uh, Mr. Tompkins, the applicant's agent? If I could ask you to come and take a seat. Welcome to the meeting, Mr. Tompkins. I'll call upon you to speak following the uh, officer's presentation. So, this is um, agenda item number seven. This is application before us is Sheep Cots Ullingswick, the erection of one dwelling of outstanding design and associated works, including access, landscaping, outbuildings, infrastructure, lake creation, and other engineering works. We'll go over to the officer, Mr. Banks. Mr. Banks, would you do your thing? Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, good morning, members, uh, and thank you to those of you that were able to attend yesterday's site meeting. Um, as the Chairman just said, the application before members today seeks planning permission for the erection of a dead dwelling and associated infrastructure and engineering works at uh, Sheepcots Court at Ullingswick. The site lies approximately one mile to the northeast of Ullingswick, uh, as, as is denoted by the red stars on the screen. It's a resubmission following a previous refusal by Planning Committee on the 29th of September 2021, based on a single reason for refusal, which is set out at paragraph 1.5 of the officer's report. At that time, much of the debate related to the lack of information and confidence that the scheme represented a truly outstanding design. To address this, the applicant's agent and their applicant and their agents have returned to the Design Midlands panel to further explain the ethos of their design and to seek a further review. And I'll return to this matter later in the presentation. Next slide, please. 
So the site here is outlined in red and comprises four parcels of land amounting to 12.3 hectares of grade three good to moderate agricultural land. The site is isolated in the sense of its relationship to a settlement, which the courts have held to be the determining factor in this regard. Although it is accepted that there are other dwellings located sporadically in the wider area. Paragraph 6.5 to 6.12 of the officer's appraisal provide a further detailed assessment of this. Next slide, please. This series of photographs show the proposed location of the dwelling. Members who attended the site visit will have noted that, it, that the topography rises from the southeast to the northwest corner of the site. The first photograph, which is a top left, looks up to the position of the dwelling from the southeastern corner of the site, whilst the photo bottom right is taken from the, from the position in the southwestern corner, where members on yesterday's site visit viewed the site from. <coughs> the two photos to the right take a perspective from the position of the dwelling, looking across the Three Rivers Ride Bridleway and that follows the hedge line in the middle distance in the photos. Next slide, please. So the concept for the scheme is a flowing design predicated on the flowing contours of the site. The teardrop footprint of the main part of the dwelling gives way to split level form wider side. The route and curvature of the dwelling and access track follow the site contours citing the roof line below a local ridge. The design also allows for a courtyard and parking area to be provided at the rear of the building, removing vehicles from the front aspect that would otherwise impede views of it. Next slide, please. This two-dimensional representation of the front, which is a south-facing elevation, shows how the stone-fronted facade will have recessed windows. This provides balcony areas and also helps to reduce overheating during the summer months. Next slide, please. These cross sections demonstrate that the overall effect is a dwelling which will be set into the hillside rather than merely being placed upon it. An important point to be considered when assessing the proposal's landscape impacts and its compliance with paragraph 80 of the MPPF. The upper levels create a loggier type arrangement with the actual front facade set back behind the stone outer layer. Not only, does this not only does the resultant overhanging roof help to reduce overheating, it also helps to mitigate light pollution, as well as reducing any visual impact of the glazing from long distance views. Uh, special glass has also been specified to reduce light spill and reflection further. Next slide, please. Locally sourced stone and timber are to be used in the construction of the dwelling and it is designed to passive house standards. <coughs> Renewable technologies are incorporated to provide the relatively small amount of energy that the building requires. A proposed Tesla Powerball, Powerwall scalable battery system is key to this. Together with an earth energy bank and heat pump, photovoltaic thermal panels, ground supercharger and the Tesla Powerwall, the arrangements for energy provision will be the first of its kind in the UK. Officers take the view that this is one particular element that addresses the criteria of the MPPF in earmarking the proposal as truly outstanding. Next slide, please. As a whole, the development is of an individual and unique design, which is carefully positioned to maximise views from the development and limit potential landscape and visual impact. This is achieved by its flowing form, <coughs> appropriate material choice, extensive and robust landscaping. The application in design and sustainability terms is considered to accord with the relevant core strategy and NDP policies as outlined in the officer's report and with the relevant sections of the MPPF. Next slide. The proposals are truly landscape led and have been subject to the iterative iterative design process embracing ecology and green infrastructure. The submitted landscape and visual impact appraisal summarises that the effects on the <coughs> national landscape character would be negligible to positive. 
effects on regional landscape character would be minor to positive, <coughs> and effects on the local landscape character would be between minor and moderate. And moderate. Similar conclusions have been reached by the Council's Senior Landscape Officer in her assessment of the application. Enhancements include the creation of parkland with new trees and grasslands to the southeast of the existing sheep <coughs> property, the restoration of an old orchard in the middle third of the site, which includes the restoration of a field boundary hedge, which once bisected this field, and the restoration <coughs> of the northern part of the field closest to the proposed dwelling, to a traditional wildflower uh, hay meadow. Officers take the view that these improvements not only are significant in terms of landscape enhancements, but also represent significant biodiversity and ecological enhancements that weigh in favour of the development as a whole. Without the proposal, it's highly unlikely that these benefits would be approved. The proposal also includes improvements to the Three Rivers Ride Bridleway through the installation of more accessible and user-friendly fencing and gates, and the provision of seating and interpretation boards with views across the proposed Orchard Lake. Next slide, please. The enhancements respond directly to policies LD1 and LD3 of the core strategy, which is consistent with Section 15 of the MPPF, and policies OPG1 and OPG11 of the Open Pictures Group MPP, providing a genuine synergy between the landscape and architecture. This slide shows a key viewpoint to give an idea of how the site will be experienced well when approaching along the vehicular accents. The landscape enhancements proposed are significant. They go over and above the, those which might ordinarily be expected of a typical residential development within or adjacent to a town or village and are considered to represent an acceptable mitigation for the development. <coughs> Members will note that the Senior Landscape Officer raises no objection to the scheme, subject to the imposition of conditions, which will secure the implement, implementation of these elements, as well as maintenance and long-term management of these aspects, necessary to secure paragraph AT status. Next slide. <coughs> From an ecology perspective, the Ecological Enhancement Strategy and Management Plan explains in depth all of the measures that are being taken to ensure that the project delivers a significant <coughs> gain biodiversity. The mature hedgerows and trees on the site will be retained. There are opportunities for remaining habitats to be significantly enhanced for wildlife and nature conservation. The arable field and semi improved grassland fields currently provide poor potential habitat for fallen species. Further habitat creation and native planting would significantly improve the land for wildlife through the provision and reinforcement of green corridors and ecological networks within the site and beyond into the wider countryside. With regard to HRA matters, the scheme takes existing farmland that has been used for arable farming out of production. The provision of a single dwelling utilising a combined treatment facility consisting of a package treatment works drainage mound and wetland with, with an orchard being created on a significant proportion of the site's area would lead to a phosphate reduction on an annual basis. <coughs> the Council's phosphate <coughs> calculator has been used to establish nutri nutrient neutrality on the basis of the scheme proposed and the proposal also meets the criteria set out in the, condition, in the Council's position statement. Accordingly, the scheme has demonstrated that there will be no nutrient pathways to foul water discharges to the river of catchment. On the basis of the agreed position with Natural England, where this is demonstrated, schemes can be screened out at stage one of appropriate assessment, and further consultation with them is not required. Surface water can be managed through appropriate on-site sustainable drainage arrangements, as confirmed through the comments from the Council's land drainage engineer. And the proposal is considered to be compliant with policies SD3 and SD4 of the full strategy. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, the question members must ask themselves is whether they feel that they can now come to a different conclusion from the previous single reason for refusal. <coughs> And now conclude that the proposal meets the criteria as set out by paragraph 80E of the MPPF. It's the view of your officers that it does. And the 
points to consider are as follows. It is a, a proposal that is truly outstanding and reflects the highest standards of architecture and thus complies with our strategy and by extension NDP policy OPG2. It would raise the standard of design more generally in the area and would set a benchmark for the developments. Furthermore, it is considered that the scheme does bring landscape and biodiversity enhancements to the <coughs> setting and wider area, which without the scheme would not occur. And finally, the design takes account of the topography at the site, demonstrates that it is sensitive to the, sensitive to the defining characteristics of the local area. But it's not only your officer's view uh, that this is the case. Parish Council now lend their support to the application after previously objecting to it. There are no objections from either statutory or technical consultees. As I touched on in my introduction, the proposals have, prior to submission, been considered again by an independent and impartial design review panel, Design Midlands, who were formerly made. They're comprised of preeminent national and international practitioners in their respective fields, including planning, architecture, landscape design, and engineering, and they're very well placed to comment on, comment on proposals of this nature. They've provided a positive response in their most recent review, the concluding paragraph of their report reading as follows. The panel consider that overall, this is now an exceptional design, bringing so many things together well. <coughs> Proportions and elevations, materials, sustainability, and in particular, a special relationship between the building and a significantly enhanced surrounding landscape. The external frame and fenestration are now elegant and well conceived. The building has a presence, and rightly so. The architect has kept to a pure narrative, stayed true to the flow house concept. A clear and positive endorsement of the before you. And therefore, as set out in the officer's report, the application is accordingly recommended for approval subject to conditions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Banks. <clears throat> we'll now move over to you, Mr. Tompkins, in your capacity as the applicant's agent, and you have three minutes to speak in support of the application. You can hold on till. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Tompkins. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, Members. This application is the culmination of more than five years' work and is made on the premise that the development is about standing design to provide a core strategy and MDPF support over this location. It follows a previous application which was refused for one reason, predicated on a design review panel having not provided a final report which confirmed that the design was about standing. Whilst Design Midlands, a panel made up of some of the country's leading architects and landscape architects, have been consulted throughout, members sought a definitive report from them confirming their advice had been enacted. A report has since been issued by Design Midlands. They confirm the building is of an outstanding design, whereby the sole reason for refusal is in our view overcome, and the scheme complies with planning policy, particularly paragraph 18 of the MPPF. Another important material change is that the Parish Council no longer, longer objects to the application, rather they support. To recap, the applicants are Mr. and Mrs. Perry, who are hoping to build a house for their family. Mr. Perry is the former chairman of Central Group, a company synonymous with Herefordshire, which employs more than 150 people. Perry's contributes to community life in the area and throughout the county. The Perrys would very much like to stay in the area and continue to give back to the county, and this house would allow them to do that. The applicants first approached Herefordshire Council for their pre-application advice when the proposals were nothing more than an idea. After receiving a positive response, the applicants appointed a highly respected architect, a landscape architect, to develop a design which is both outstanding and which significantly enhances its setting. The applicants involved the council in every opportunity and found officers engagement invaluable throughout. The proposals achieve outstanding design as confirmed by Design Midlands through delivering a building of the highest architectural standards and which responds positively to its setting. The scheme also gives rise to significant landscape and biodiversity enhancements through the planting of extensive new traditional orchards, a wildflower meadow, hedgerow, wetlands, and other features. Importantly, the proposals utilise emerging technologies which combine to provide a truly innovative and unique solution to generating and storing energy. The development truly responds to the Council's climate emergency. This is a very substantial benefit of the proposals. 
In summary, the application includes the one item sought by this committee, the design Midlands report. <coughs> the scheme complies with all relevant planning policy and delivers a development of the highest quality. <coughs> Truly addresses the climate emergency. We therefore ask that you support your officer's recommendation and approve the application. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tokins. Excellent in time. Uh, we now move over to the ward member. Thanks to Jonathan Lester, he's the local ward member for this item. He was going to join remotely. He is now, as you can see, very much physical. Can we have a proper view to move the camera? Or... Oh, we got you. Yeah. 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 Send for the picture for uh, Councillor Lester. Oh, that's that's right, Jonathan. He speaks <laughs> first and then has the right to speak at the end of the debate. He does not have a vote and he has a 10 minute limit. Thank you, Councillor Lester. Thank you, Chair. I, I don't have a vote, and nor would I want one. Um, very difficult decision before you. Um, thanks to the committee members who made to the went to the site visit yesterday. Uh, members will recall, and some of them at the site visit yesterday will recall that this uh, was decided uh, previously, and at that stage, I was not able to support the application. I am willing to support individual developments. And, um, you know, I've, I acknowledge that this applicant, Mr. Perry and Mr. Perry, have put a lot of time and effort into this scheme that seeks your approval today, and that is acknowledged, truly. But at the last committee, I couldn't uh, support the scheme because of the local objections. Uh, this time, there are about the same amount of objections, and for me, there's no substantive difference between this scheme and the last proposal. So therefore, I'm not able to support the application this time. The objections have focused on the perceived harm the proposal would have, the landscape area, the conservation area, agricultural land, settings to listed buildings. I'm mindful of the fact that the applicant seeks to have the application determined by NPPF paragraph 80E. Firstly, for me, um, there's an issue as to whether the application is truly isolated. Uh, paragraph uh, 6.9 of the report concludes that this is a planning judgment based on the facts of the case. As I pointed out at the site visit, when we stood at the site looking at the, uh, the field, the development was not isolated uh, because it was quite near to the Sheepcots complex itself, and it is only 570 metres away from the conservation area. So if the proposal is not isolated, then it shouldn't be judged by paragraph 80E. If the committee does feel that it is isolated and it should be uh, looked at in view of the paragraph 80E, then the two tests are truly outstanding, which is the, what is being put before you, reflecting the highest standards of architecture, which would raise the standards of uh, design more generally and would <clears throat> enhance the immediate setting and be sensitive to the characteristics of the area. Um, firstly, to the matter of deciding whether it's outstanding architecture or not, I would have to say it is fundamentally subjective. I appreciate that the applicant's gone to the trouble of commissioning another report uh, by a panel of experts. <coughs> they themselves quote Frank Lloyd Wright when coming to their conclusions. What I would ask this committee to consider is when they're wearing up the merits of the scheme, Whatever the conclusions of design Midlands have made, these are informed, but by themselves are still subjective. Those from design uh, Midlands may wish to be impartial, and I've no doubt that they are, but we must not confuse the idea of our impartiality with being objective. In short, whether this proposal is outstanding or not is a matter for this committee to decide. Um, a crucial concern for me is that whether it enhances the immediate area of the setting. Personally, pers firstly, it's difficult to reconcile the idea that such a large scale development would enhance the immediate setting. No matter how much it is proposed to flow into the hillside, its sheer size and scale seems to rule out the idea that it, it would in some way enhance immediate, the immediate setting, in this case, an agricultural <coughs> field. I would argue that its position at the top of the slope, presumably done to maximise the views that would be achieved, is not what Frank Lloyd Wright was, was envisaging when he was saying set it to the hillside. 
Secondly, it's difficult to see how such a modern design is sensitive to the local area. The report states that the location is isolated because it's 570 meters away from Allenswick Conservation Area, but its modern design is in stark contrast to the existing buildings that have been there largely unchanged since the 19th century. So by virtue of its size, it's difficult to see how it's sensitive to the local area. In terms of its environmental credentials, it's argued that there will be significant and extensive landscaping. Um, and also there's going to be uh, proposed a, a, a condition that says that the landscaping should be kept in perpetuity or to the life of the development. I think that anything that requires so much landscaping it is just to me saying, screaming out loud, that it is the scale of the development is far too much. Um, I do not think that it is sensitive to the defining characteristics of the local area. It certainly has an impact, but I would suggest that that would be better uh, in a more urban setting. The local neighbourhood plan requires proposals to respect the character of adjoining developments with the wider landscape having regarding to siting and scale. Again, the sheer scale of the development seems to be out of keeping with this aspiration. Once again, I take issue with the conservation area officer's comments about the fact that, well, this is an acceptable size because it's comparable with what landed gentry or aristocracy used to build. I, again, respectfully suggest that times <coughs> have moved on and it's the scale of housing development <coughs> in open countryside should be seen in terms of housing need and be proportionate to that. Members who attended the site visit will be uh, mindful of the fact that it's proposed to be a considerable way away from the public highway. So in order to uh, do this, further alterations to the landscape will have to be uh, incorporated to provide access. The officer report states that it is a bold proposal. However, I would put forward that there seem to be contradictions with the overall concept. It's thought to be environmentally friendly, and yet it's very large scale. It's thought to be prominent, and yet it's judged to fit into the hillside. And it's deemed to be isolated, that it's easily reached from the highway network. Paragraph 4.6.49 uh, argues that the scheme would conserve the local heritage assets through sympathetic design. I, I cannot think why, um, because as I say, it's not that it isn't interesting, but it is out of keeping with the locality. One of the things that uh, I'm concerned about is paragraph 6.4, where it's arguing that agricultural land is poor for habitat. And therefore, the logic is that if you build a large house, then this will introduce more biodiversity in, in the area. I would respectfully request, uh, suggest that the best way to encourage wildlife is to alter the landscape as least as possible. And then weighing up the issue of the phosphates in um, paragraph 6.61, it's arguing that the loss of arable land is preferable because a house will give off less phosphates than farming will. I do find this an alarming argument. And if we follow that, we should be building on more farmland to develop housing rather than preserve agriculture. So I do not think this uh, argument could be used to justify the prime of agricultural land. In summary, uh, I do not believe that the proposal meets paragraph 80, not isolated, um, but by virtue of its scale and design, I would say that it's not in keeping with the landscape area, the conservation area, the loss of arable lands, and the concerns about phosphates provision, I do not think justify um, building a house of this scale. So I would summarize by saying it's contrary to policies SS1, it's not sustainable development of its size, policy SS2, no justification for a new home, contrary to the local NDP, uh, contrary to LD1, adverse impact on landscape, fails to respect the local buildings in the conservation area. So in summary, it would fail to meet our own three. But as I said at the beginning, it's for this committee to decide. 
I welcome your comments and debate with interest. Thank you for your time. Excellent. Nine minutes. Thank you, Councillor Lester. Uh, I now go to the committee and invite debate. I had Councillor Hardwick giving me the wink at least 10 minutes ago, so we'll go to Councillor Hardwick and then we'll come to Councillor Shaw. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I think it was uh, very useful as we had a site visit yesterday um, to give us perspective of, of the location of this uh, proposed dwelling. Um, I wasn't present the last time it was in uh, front of the committee, so uh, I had no sort of um, prior knowledge of it in effect. Um, but what I will say is that um, over the years, and especially in the 60s, many um, rural cottages, etc., were condemned. And um, I'm thinking about my own uh, location. Um, on the three farms surrounding me, there was probably six or seven cottages that have been demolished that were essentially class of open countryside. And uh, I think personally it was a loss, loss to our area. But um, I take on board that uh, Design Midlands now has um, commended the, uh, the design of this. I personally think it's an excellent design that um, in the position that uh, it's uh, expected to be built. Um, I think it would fit in there exceptionally well. The, uh, the landscaping that is proposed, I think, will be a benefit to the area. Um, I note that the parish council now support it. And um, I believe that uh, we should support this application. And I'm happy to propose that uh, the application is supported. You'd like to propose that the application as per the officer's recommendation? I do. Thank you. Do we have a seconder for that? Councillor Bolter. Okay, we will continue the debate. Uh, Councillor Shaw, I've got you up next. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, contrary, I suppose, to, to the comments of my uh, uh, esteemed colleague, uh, councillor colleague. <laughs> um, in terms of the um, uh, treatment of the word isolated or isolation, um, if you go back to the Court of Appeal judgment by Lord Justice Lindblom, he said that the word isolated in the phrase isolated homes in the countryside simply connotated a dwelling that is physically separate or remote from a settlement. <coughs> Um, and, and he furthermore said the proposed new dwelling, whether the proposed new dwelling is or is not isolated in this sense, will be a matter of fact and planning judgment for the decision maker, which I guess is this committee, um, in, in the particular circumstances of the case in hand. So I don't think that's something that um, uh, should weigh um, heavily with us. Um, however, philosophically, we may be concerned about new uh, dwellings in open countryside. I think um, paragraph 80 of the MPPF um, does provide those exceptional circumstances for allowing such construction of isolated dwellings in the countryside. I, I understand that the MPPF is not legally binding in itself, but we are obliged to take it into account when we reach our decision. Um, I also note that any MPPF, that would be the Occal Pie Child Group MPPF, would take precedent over uh, non-strategic planning policies in the MPPF, but I understand from the officer's report that policy OBG24 um, is effectively in, uh, in a, an agreement with, with this um, development, um, and I'd just like confirmation of, of, of that. Given the impartial review panel recommendations and, and their comments, I have um, I have difficulty in seeing any planning material planning reasons why this application should not be um, approved. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Councillor Shaw. Mr. Banks, did you have a, a reply? I think you wanted confirmation on um, just confirmation that the MPPF um, 
uh, point OPG 2.4 is in agreement with the application. Chair, would you just mind giving us a minute just to... Yes, of course. Yeah, so we, we will move on to Councillor Mill, who's probably going to throw up just as complicated a... Uh, 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 Mel. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I remember when. Oh, I think it's the Councillor Bowie. No, I'll, refer to you. You. I'll come after you, if I may. No, I've definitely got Councillor Mill down next. Well, well, uh, I'll give my hand up. Away, I appreciate that. Um, so, yes, I remember uh, when this came up in 2021, uh, and on that occasion, uh, I think we all agreed this really did very much hang on NPPF 80E. Uh, and that we did accept that this is uh, a, uh, a development in the open countryside, that's a settlement boundary, and therefore it very much has to meet that exception test of exceptional quality. Um, and it's sometimes worth reminding what it, what it says, uh, design exceptional quality and it is truly outstanding, reflecting the highest standards of architecture uh, and also would help raise standards of design more generally, and secondly, would significantly enhance its immediate setting. ATE is not the uh, iteration of the Gummer Clause, which it, uh, started out life as in 1997 after John Gummer introduced this idea, uh, that uh, the case officer quotes, because the earlier iteration also included the word innovative. So we could have uh, buildings that were of innovative quality. So I'm afraid fancy tech and uh, Tesla power walls and so on do not count. This hinges entirely upon architectural design quality and upon uh, enhancing the immediate setting. Really nothing else. So is it sufficient simply to assert as Midlands Design Panel does, and the case officer quoted, uh, that the panel consider it is now an exceptional design, uh, when we heard that the panel, albeit it was a differently constituted panel, uh, in their previous submission that uh, I quoted in 2021, were extremely lukewarm about it. In fact, they were full of misgivings. They did not, the panel didn't consider the external appearance to be fully resolved or convincing in terms of its detail. There was not attention given, enough attention given to the long, long distance appearance. Uh, more care consideration needs to be given to minimizing light pollution. Uh, extensive alterations and extensions to the original farmhouse are not well coordinated, and so on and so on. Those were the comments of the previous panel author whose name was Meredith Evans. So we have a new panel author, uh, Julie Tanner. I'm sure she's a splendid person. She has uh, perfectly entitled to her views, but she's basically looking at exactly the same scheme. It is precisely the same scheme that we looked at in 2021. So uh, on what basis do you suddenly change your mind, suddenly decide that it is of exceptional quality? Uh, and frankly, the two and a half pages of their submission failed to give us an answer on that. Uh, much of the two and a half pages is concerned with um, making very odd suggestions about things like um, a parapet line needs to crumble into the landscape, or the third layer of a different colour stone is suggested to conceive a, a better mansard ease there, and so on. I mean, that's all sorts could, of objects are happening. So, uh, and they also, have I got another minute? You, no, you've got about 10 seconds just to close your mouth. Well, I just wanted to mention Vitruvius, who uh, uh, defined the principles of proportion for us in the first century BC, in, including the gold section. Which okay, was thank, thank you, Councillor Mill. We've moved into the classics now, so I think we'll uh, draw that to its natural uh, end. Uh, Councillor Bowen. Well, I think, Mr. Chairman, I thoroughly enjoyed Councillor Mill's Rue de Montard. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. Yeah. He's my, he is my favourite too. Yeah. My <laughs> I have much sympathy with his comments. And I'm sure that um, well, I'm delighted that someone, someone in this country can actually afford these amazing buildings. It's great, I think. And coming to Herefordshire, that's also very good too, possibly. 
And I think Mr. Albert Spear might have been very interested in this building as well, and I've probably given it approval. Um, so I think we need to think, does it comply with our planning policies, etc.? And is it distinctive enough? Is it outstanding enough? And does it also, is it truly outstanding? Is it just, well, it's not very subjective, isn't it? Is it an enhancement of the setting? Is it sensitive to the local area and buildings? Probably not, I think. Very different indeed. Is it sensitive to the local plan? Questionable. It's a bold proposal. Is it in keeping with its locality? <coughs> I think you've got to answer these questions in your own mind and be very positive and sure about it. I really do think you have to take very careful consideration. <coughs> it is very similar to the last proposal and this committee uh, turned it down, I think, with quite good cause and uh, reason. And has it changed enough? Are we reassured enough that this Midland Design Group can give us that reassurance that it is so brilliantly outstanding that we can now consider it in a different light altogether? Your all decisions, obviously, our decisions. Thank you. Thank you. I think now we can go back to Mr. Banks and Ms. Gibbons to do with. No, just, just we're going to we're going to had a question put up earlier from uh, Councillor Shaw, and it took a little bit of research to confirm a, a very accurate answer. So we can go back to Mr. Banks. Thank you. Um, thanks for giving us the time to look. So policy OPG two um, relates to development needs and requirements, and specifically point four of that says acknowledging the potential for new residential development in the countryside outside the defined settlement boundaries including where this meets the requirements of the local plan court strategy policy ra3 and allied policies uh, and ra3 does refer back to uh, the previous iteration of the mp uh, mppf but essentially paragraph 80 um, for allowing these types of development Councillor Shaw? Just so it's clear in my mind, um, Mr. Banks, is, does that mean, is the paragraph in the MPPF, paragraph 80, is that a non strategic planning policy or a strategic planning policy? Because I'm just trying to understand whether the MPPF takes precedent, over, uh, whether the local plan takes precedent over the MPPF in this instance. Yeah, I think the, the fact is, is that it certainly reinforces it, that, that, that. Correct. That so, so the, the, but, but it reinforces it in a precedential manner, I, I believe. But I'm, I'm looking for legal guidance, really. The development um, plan is yeah. what well, is the core strategy and the NDP. Yeah. Move it louder, please. Yeah. So the. I didn't put the microphone back on. Um, the uh, development plan is the core strategy, which is yep. policy RA3, and the end, and the made NDP, which is this. The policy R, which the NDP refers back to RA3. Yeah. Policy RA3 in itself refers back to the national planning policy framework as right. the guide. Yeah. So that is a significant material consideration that is led by <coughs> policy, I guess, right. if that's. That okay. It does full circle. I think what we're saying is that the local um, uh, neighbourhood plan it, it is, is significantly um, uh, directs us towards uh, uh, taking a, a hefty material consideration of the MPPF paragraph 18. Okay. Uh, Perhaps I just thanks. comment on um, the, the whole issue as far as the uh, report from. Design Midlands is concerned. Yeah, please do, because we've got a number of speakers to come and it may help them with uh, posing their questions. So when you considered the first application, um, the report that you saw at that time was about um, a scheme that was partly complete. So it wasn't the finally submitted scheme <coughs> that made as they were back then considered. So when it went back to them, they saw <coughs> An updated scheme so they saw they saw the same scheme that you saw at that time but that wasn't the scheme that made made their comments on originally so they have they have reviewed the scheme as it is in its current form 
uh, I believe so. We'll soon find out. <laughs> Councillor Watson. Oh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, I just um, just wanted to make one statement: is that I found it really difficult with the satellite pictures to actually see where the house is going to be within the satellite and its zoning. I think that um, if there is a picture that actually shows the satellite view of where the site is with the house in it, because we've had pictures of the um, building, but it's actually really quite hard to see how it sits within the landscape. I'm a great fan of grand designs. I am a, I love that program. And, um, and I'm also passionate about green agriculture, uh, green agriculture and green infrastructure. And uh, for me, um, I think it's a really interesting point. Is it open countryside? Is it RA2, RA3? Is it exceptional? For me, it's about, does it need um, in PPF 80? Is it passive house or is it passive solar? Because I'm very confused about if it's brick, uh, what's the insulation? Does it have a green roof? If not, why not? Wouldn't the green roof look more, you know, blend into the landscape? What's the, uh, with passive house is that it's a sealed property um, and everything has to be sealed. So I'm assuming that there is a mechanical ventilation heat recovery system in, installed. So what's the solar panels for and what's the heat pump for? Um, the other issues is that there is poor circulation on the ground. And as a permaculturist, which is a design system of uh, regenerative agriculture, is that um, it's really sad to see that, yes, there's a pond for the runoff, but where is the zoning of the landscape from the house to the landscape? Is it exceptional in my view? No, I'm sorry, it's not. I don't think it really does meet, um, as someone who is really passionate about green ag um, architecture, green infrastructure, and having sat into the green infrastructure strategy on the 31st of January. Um, I, I, if, if it was RA2, um, I don't think the design reflects the size, role, and function of this global segment. I'm not a brown board sign. Um, yes, it's, it's fantastic that we are on route to have sustainable building, but the amount of carbon required to build this house is truly <laughs> exceptional. <laughs> and I think that, um, you know, for me, I can't support it. I just don't think it meets um, MPPF 80, and I support, um, you know, the ward member for his statements. Um, and um, does it, and I think it goes against our race six, it doesn't support and strengthen the local food um, and drink production. So, yeah, that's me. Excellent. That was spot on three minutes, Councillor Thank Watson. You. Thank you. Thank Councillor Polly Andrews. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And I understand that the only difference between the, this application and the previous application is that the organisation called Design Midlands has been called in and they think it's wonderful. I didn't know who this organisation was. Like many other members of the council, I think I'd never heard of it before. So I looked it up last night and discovered it's a conglomeration of architects, landscape gardeners, no doubt all very worthy. But this does not indicate the argument that this is quite simply a development in the open countryside. That's what it is, plain and simple. Do we allow it or do we not? I, I can't think that if we, if we open the floodgates, we'll have more of them. Um, and I, just a comment, I can't believe that this, this extremely unusual and very original design will affect, raise the standard of design in Hunnings Week generally. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Andrews. Now, Councillor Millmore? Yeah, um, we, we've really got to judge this on its, on its own merits. Uh, references to ancient architects or Hitler's architect. Um, I just don't think are appropriate. Um, no. It seems to me that it has met its um, requirements materially. Um, I know it's sub subjective, um, but of course, you know, everything's subjective. I can't, I don't think we can uh, judge it on subjective grounds. 
Um, so I think some of the comments that being made are, are subjective. So I think that really, um, I can't see how we can refuse this application. Okay. Thank you, Councillor No More. Councillor Norman. Thank you, Chair. Um, of course, it's subjective. Anything that comes to this committee is difficult, interesting, and is with us because there are different sides to the story. Um, it was very interesting. Glad I did get to that site visit. Uh, it was absolutely fascinating. I actually love the design. I, I really love it. I, I'm very interested and very supportive of modern design, particularly something super distinctive. And, and I think this is in many, many ways. Um, there are lots of good things about it. Um, uh, we're told it's a passive house, or there's question marks over quite what that means in this context. Please to see there's no tarmac, so you know a road can be produced that doesn't produce something as negative and as unattractive as that. We're reassured about nutrient neutrality. Um, there are a lot of good things about this. Exceptional design, I will absolutely go along with that. I think it's fabulous looking. But unfortunately, there are also that it's subjective. There are other sides to this. The construction impact. Um, you know, the, the, it's clearly going to make a difference to wildlife and the biodiversity of the area. Could not love the idea of the orchard. That's a wonderful plus. Um, but there are too many, uh, for me, too many uh, problems with this. Um, one small thing, in a way, but it really did make a difference to me was visiting the site. It's so tidy. It's super duper tidy, moaned with an inch of its life, uh, immaculate, which for some people is great. That's not natural. That's not going to be good for uh, the environment, for wildlife, and all the rest of it. Will it enhance the area? Well, of course, it will in many ways. And I have swung, believe me, I have swung quite a bit over this. Um, but ultimately, it is development in the countryside. It will have serious impacts in its construction, not least. Uh, travel is inevitable, no services within, within reach, um, and I, I don't think I can support this, I'm afraid, in spite of the many positive aspects of it. Um, difficult, but um, ultimately I think that's my situation. Thank you, Councillor Norman. Councillor Prober? Um, so, I did think why when I first saw the plans yesterday, um, but really not on it, and I do love a bit of brand design, so I'm quite intrigued. Um, you are really trying to create something special, and if the design and the parish council, I think I would like to support it. Okay. Thank you, the council. Public. Do we have any other speakers? Councillor Foxton. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I'm struggling with this application. I'm swinging back and forth. It is undoubtedly a most spectacular design, the type of dwelling one might expect to find on grand designs. I just believe the house is in the wrong location and it would be quite incongruous in this most beautiful countryside. I did wonder, and I'm hearing lots of things here, which is great for me, but I in retrospect, I query why the place was so manicured. It was very, very tidy. Not really what one sees in the countryside. I also wondered, under all those mounds, what might be under there, but that's something for um, Councillor Mill. <laughs> um, now, buildings ought to blend and complement an area, whereas I fear this design would stand out for the wrong reasons. Um, and it's an amazing design, but regrettably, I just don't feel it belongs in Allensworth. And also, interestingly enough, Councillor Polly Andrews mentioned the question whether a design would influence Allensworth. <laughs> and no, I doubt it. You know, it's, it, 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 it's just a bit empty. Okay. <coughs> Thank you very much. Councillor Foxton, anybody else to speak? Councillor Tillet. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just very briefly, and perhaps for, for Councillor Watson's assistance, um, yeah, I, I, I agree the presentation doesn't help us in terms of the siting, so I went back to the original 
uh, planning application. And it is at the, at the sort of very far top of that site. Um, uh, and, and that was referred to, I think, partly by someone saying, well, you know, has it been cited there predominantly for the view rather than actually blending into the... Uh, but also, the um, consequence of that is obviously it is at the furthest point from the access to the road. So the amount of um, vehicular traffic during the very considerable construction and, and indeed the environmental disturbance and degradation that will occur while that is taking place because it is such a, a long way away, I, I think is, uh, is a material consideration. Uh, but I offer it mainly for my colleagues' information. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you Councillor Tillett. Uh, any more speakers? Okay. Um, I, I will say, uh, members, that with, with the uh, application, with the um, officer's report, we were told that there was a single solitary reason, a sole reason with the words used, that we turned down an exact application uh, some 15, 16 months ago. So, uh, if and I'm, I'm picking up that this is going to be a very close vote. So for those who are minded to vote either against this um, application, we will need some absolutely real watertight reasons. So if you are minded to vote that way, I wouldn't just leave it for the person sat next to you to decide or to, to piggyback on what uh, Councillor Lester said. Let's have some genuine reasons that you thought of if you are going to vote <coughs> against. However, I'm not prejudging anything. Uh, we will go to Mr. Banks and Ms. Yeah. Gibbons if you would like to uh, sum up at all. Did I steal your thunder bit then? Sorry. No. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah, you did. Fine. <laughs> uh, okay, anything from? I agree with what you say. We need some really good or genuine reasons for refusal if it, the vote does go that way. Lovely, okay. Uh, we will now return to Councillor Lester as ward member to sum up. <laughs> we all need a reminder. Like having your picture taken here. <laughs> there we go. Love being on Charles. Sorry, Sorry, Charles. There we go. Um, okay. Got the the wrong, wrong, got the face for the radio. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I'd like to thank the committee for, for giving this a fair hearing and for debating all the issues, in particular whether something subjective or not, or whether a professional view is something I think you would take on as being objective or subjective or informed or what have you. Uh, I appreciate that discussion. <coughs> Ultimately, when you're discussing whether or not uh, this application is uh, acceptable or not, it's a matter of whether or not what is perceived to be a good design is outweighs protecting the environment as it is. So when you're weighing up those factors, and there's, you know, it's difficult to find an answer sometimes, if you're concerned about the environment, we're in this environment, not the environment, I mean this environment, is it in keeping with Arlingswick? Councillor Thompson said, you know, does it belong in Arlingswick? He's not convinced. There are policies there that protect the conservation area. There are policies there that protect landscape. There are policies there that protect conservation. There are policies there that want development to pass on and help the vernacular and you know the, the, the design, enhance the design. And if you're not confident that this scheme does that, and if you're not confident that the scale of it can be justified, then there are many policies within the context of the core strategy, the MPPF, and the, uh, the, the local plan, which, which, which can be used to deploy that, you know, despite the fact that it's been put forward as a, a design that many of us have never seen before, is that the price worth paying for um, outweighing the consideration of protecting Ullingswick the open countryside and arable farmland. And I'm just <coughs> close by thinking about uh, the local parish neighbourhood plan, which it says the proposal should respect the character of adjoining development, a wider landscape, and having regard to the siting and scale, height and massing. As you know, although I appreciate that it's a, 
a design that many will welcome is the scale of the development in that location is of greatest concern to me. But thank you for your deliberations, and I, I leave it up to you to make the right decision. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Lester. Uh, we are now going to confirm that the uh, proposed by Councillor Hardwick, seconded by Councillor Bolter, that uh, we go with officer recommendation. Uh, I would remind members of the committee you can only vote on an application um, if you have been present for the whole of the presentation and discussion. With that in mind, can I ask for all those in favour of the application? All those against? Against. So I take us no abstentions then. So no, one one abstention. abstention. Right. We now need your reasons for voting against. Um, who would like to <coughs> kick this off? Councillor Watson. Um, yeah, and I do really respect the work that's gone into this, but um, for me, you know, as uh, we've already discussed, is that it is subjective. It's about all of these policies can be used either for or against. So for me, I don't think it does meet, um, you know, I've gone on to the report, so I'm just going through what um, Andy has uh, put down. I, I actually don't think that it meets RA2. I don't think it meets RA3. I don't think it meets RA6. It doesn't meet LD1 because it doesn't conserve the natural landscape. LD3, and green infrastructure, and with the green infrastructure strategy coming out, I don't think it meets that either. Um, I just don't see that it meets, um, I think the big thing for me is that it's the, um, it has got sustainable design and energy efficiency, brilliant, but I don't think it has a green roof. That would have really helped me um, see it. In wastewater treatment, there's uh, no natural ecological waste treatment. So we could have had weed bed systems and, and, and things like that. So, um, so it doesn't mean SD1, SD3, or SD4. Um, and they're the ones. So, and, but exceptional, because it's NPPF 80E, is it exceptional? Does it fit in? And I say no. Okay. And, and that would be, and, and that is a very subjective view. Okay. So, Councillor Watson, thank you for that. I will move on to other members in a moment, but okay. there is a, a very, very extensive re-bed yep. system Sorry. proposed yep. for this. Okay. So to highlight that... Okay, is, is so I will just go then for SD1. So the, the ones that I will go for is um, RA2, RA3, RA6, LD1, LD3, and um, SD1. Okay, other members who voted against, could I have Councillor Hardwick, just, is this? Just to make a point, uh, Chairman, my motion fell. You haven't got a new motion back on the table yet. We, do, we, do we be looking for reasons why? It's not automatic. Somebody's actually got to propose. Okay, I've just refused. You're 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 proposing refusal. <laughs> yeah, is that that's right. Yeah. Okay, and then <laughs> Councillor Milne is going to second it. So your proposal is that we refuse this application based on. RA2, RA3, RA6, LD1, LD3, SD1. LD4 was also cited last time as a reason. Oh, yeah, LD4. Um, yeah, so uh, we're now here from uh, Miss Gibbons. Okay, so just to remind officers, uh, remind members, before the, the application was before you before, and there was a reason for refusal, which is in paragraph 1.5 of your report there which gave the reasons. Um, obviously, we've listened to the debate today, and which much of that has been surrounding um, the impact on the character of the landscape and um, the design issues. 
um, there hasn't been any debate as far as or discussion particularly about the impact on the conservation <coughs> in particular. But I think if we refer back to those reasons for refusal, to add all the additional reasons for refusal we were adding, suggesting that um, we need clear reasons why they were now being introduced, essentially. We've got policies SS2, SS3, RA3, LD1 and LD4. It would be helpful for me to read the read the read, or you've got the reports there to, to have a look at it. But I think it's what we would need in order to understand your reasons for refusal is examples or, or, or your clear instruction in terms of why you're referring to those policies. So why LD1, why LD4, RA2, RA3. So if you could expand upon those. Um, Council Watson, sorry, it's going to fall in your plate again because you're yeah, the proposer and you've come up with those. Um, I just find it amazing is that, you know, we're not trained planners, but we've got to somehow reason it. And my understanding is that planning officers are also working for the committee to also help us to find our way. But in terms of, you know, in policy SS2, um, says delivering new homes and is the argument that a six bedroom home is what we're wanting within this infrastructure of the local settlement is that required um, so we're delivering we're talking about one dwelling and it's a six bedroom dwelling so therefore um, you know the supply and deliverable and developable land will be identified but it is actually good land. It's good to moderate farming land. So therefore, it's that's why I say that it doesn't need RA6 because it doesn't support and strengthen local food production, which it has been used before. Where you know, so that's another reason. So if you're going to say, okay, why SS2? I would say it's because of RA6. Because we are not, you know, having, we are losing one to gain one house. So that's my reason for um, against SS2. SS3 is um, <coughs> ensuring sufficient housing and land supply, uh, land delivery. But we've actually um, achieved our, um, we've got sufficient housing in Herefordshire. We ha haven't we? We have met our housing, housing title. We've got more than five year housing supply. So again, do we need one more dwelling or a six bedroom house? Um, and, and that's my argument. RA3, um, okay, if I just bear with me yep. whilst I look into the core strategy <coughs> chair. Um, well, while you're looking for that, Council Watson, other members who voted against and sorry, other members who voted against and intend to support that, um, we've had a proposal from Council Watson, seconded by Council Mill, that uh, there's going to be refusal based on these um, reasons. Does anybody else want to contribute? Well, given that ATE has played such a big part in the discussion, surely there should be some referral back to that. Um, even just saying yeah. that we still do not feel that ATE has been met. Yeah. Okay, Council Norman. Just, uh, um, if, if this was not designated exceptional, we would be looking at it the way we'd look at any other development in the countryside, and when there are good reasons for refusing those, unsustainable, you know, need to travel, no, no service needs, numerous other things. But those stand for this. Because for some of us, the exceptional designation doesn't meet, you know, doesn't adequately meet that criteria. It is fantastic in many ways, but we've heard lots of reasons where it falls short. And so I think that is, you know, what we are trying to say is exceptional visually and in lots and lots of ways, but sustainably, no, it doesn't, um, and not sufficiently to override the. You know, the normal reasons that we would refuse to refuse. So I would go back to the normal reasons for refusing um, any development in open countryside and say those are what we're looking at um, because we don't accept the exceptional designation. It doesn't need sufficient to show us okay. three previous reasons for refusing. Yeah, um, 
I'm going to have a quick chat with our legal officer, but Ms. Gibbons is going to re read out the previous reason for refusal from 16 months ago. Okay. See if that still captures what you're trying to achieve here. So, in light of the local planning authority being able to being able to demonstrate a five-year housing land supply, the proposal, by virtue of its design and scale, would not be considered outstanding or in keeping with the character of the locality, leading to an adverse harm upon the character, landscape character and appearance of the area, <coughs> the adjacent Ullingswick conservation area, meaning it would not be representative of sustainable development. As such, the proposal is contrary to policies SS2, SS3, RA3, LD1, and LD4 of the Herefordshire Local Plan Call Strategy. <coughs> it is up to members, obviously, to put forward reasons. Uh, okay, I think what we will do, uh, we will, we've got a proposal on the table, Councillor Watson, seconded by Councillor Mill. We'll go for a vote for refusal. At that point, depending on the outcome of that vote, we will then. We had a vote, right? We've had a vote. Yeah. No, well, we'd had a vote not to accept. Yeah, we've had a vote against it. We need a vote. Okay. Right, okay. So, <coughs> so, how many policies have we got so far for refusal? It's policies and reasons, so why it's contrary. So, so we've got. Policy SS2 and RA6 in terms of loss of uh, local food production, so of agricultural land. Um, contrary to RA3 and RA2, we had as well. We had a list from Councillor Watson, wasn't it, rather than the non compliance. So, and policy, you also listed policy. LD1 and LD3. Is that from Council Watts? Did you list Council? No, it's not, but I'm very conscious that we haven't actually voted on refusing. You, you, you're voting on a ref oh, okay. refusing oh, it. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Refusal, you yeah. need to okay. understand what you're yeah, voting I've on. Been away too long. So the, <laughs> the reason for refusal, the the not just the one that's yeah, you're voting on why you're refusing it. Okay. So you need to be in agreement with the reasons that you're voting. Yeah, for. so I just need to read. Yes, <coughs> uh, Chair, could I just make a answer to Liz at this time? Can, yes. Coming, coming to this with a, a, sl a slightly fresher pair of eyes, because not. I mean, it seems to me everything uh, that Miss Gibbons has just read out as why it was refused last time hasn't changed. Nothing seemed, you know, we still a majority of us still find that it doesn't, uh, you know, it is not outstanding enough, it doesn't meet ATE sufficient to override those other concerns and those other uh, bits of the core policy, uh, which were the basis of refusing it last time. So is it not a simpler and actually a bit more, um, well, no, it's a bit more consistent, actually, I suppose is the right word, merely to vote again on exactly the same reasons as we refused it last time. Yeah. <clears throat> that, it, that, as I said, you're voting on what you put forward. That's, that, that's a decision for whoever's put in those reasons and seconding. <clears throat> if you want to add to them, that's... Are we trying to reinvent the wheel? Well, I'm happy with that as the secondary. I don't know whether you are, uh, where Councillor was. Sorry, Jim. Uh, what uh, Councillor Tillett has just suggested, yeah. namely that we vote on the basis of the reasons for refusal last time. Mm. Yep, I'm happy with that. <coughs> Yeah, can I ask that um, we have a five, six minute recess so that uh, we can just chat through this to find, uh, get some uh, positives and then come straight back to you. Is that all right, everybody? Chair, yeah. just one question. Um, referring you back to why we refused it last time, there are many in the room who weren't here last time when this came forward. So we're assessing it on what we see now. Yeah, not then. 
That's part I was of why we're going to have at the previous. That's part of why right. we're going to have a, a quick chat now. Okay. Right. Well, it's okay, but that surely it's just on those policies, yes, not on the yeah. discussion. Yeah. The motion yeah. is on the discussion on the yeah. policy. Can, can, yes. the live okay. Yep. okay. Thank you, everybody. Um, lots of conversations going on. Then this is uh, a very well chatted out one. Uh, during the two or three minutes we had off, um, officers and. Uh, sat here we uh, had a quick chat and uh, Miss Gibbons has put together some fine words which she will educate <laughs> yeah. us all with now. Okay so having regard to the debate and what's been said today I think have, and we're referring back to the, the previous reason for refusal because it seems a logical place to start um, I think that we can continue along the vein of in light of the local planning authority being able to, to demonstrate a five-year housing land supply the proposal by virtue of its design and scale would not be considered outstanding having regard to paragraph 80 of the mppf it's not in, and it's not considered to be in keeping or in character with the locality leading to adverse harm upon the character landscape character and appearance of the area i think it's worth adding some words in there about local distinctiveness because that's been talked about a lot today as well um, in terms of um, referencing that as well um, my concern is that previously we referenced policy LD4 in respect to Ellingswick conservation area. I don't believe we should continue along that vein, given that the professional officers have said there is no harm and there hasn't been particular debate about that aspect. So I would leave LD4 out of it. Um, and therefore we would be referenced um, and we would conclude that it is not representative of sustainable development and be contrary to policies SS2, SS3, RA3, and LD1 of the Heritage <coughs> Local Plan Core Strategy. If you wish to add SS6 and RA6. SS7. Uh, SS, uh, SS6 and RA6, you talked about the loss yeah, of agricultural SS, land. Yeah, and RA6, definitely. SS7, are you talking about climate design and climate um, change and the design sustainability credentials? Yeah, because that supports the RA6. Okay. That so doesn't support because RA7 um, is <coughs> um, because it's um, it, it doesn't reduce the need to travel by car okay. and it doesn't support local food production. Okay. And it doesn't protect with agricultural land. So those two work together. For those reasons, then. Yeah. Right. Do we have enough? I think I'm clear enough. Yeah. Yep. Okay. If you're clear, so, right, you're voting on that, so if you're clear, right. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's. does any member here want any um, clarification on any point before I go to the vote? Okay. So the proposal by Councillor Watson, seconded by Councillor Mill, is that this application is refused. For the reasons that we've spent the last ten minutes, fifteen minutes discussing. So all those in favour of refusal. One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, seven in favour. Okay. All those against refusal. One, two, three, four, five, six. Abstentions. So that is carried. Refusal is carried. Okay. In that case, then the refusal is carried. If I could ask everybody to uh, just keep to your seats for a couple of minutes. And yeah, if we'd like to, could you confirm that the lender meeting at this time and could you confirm that the live broadcast is. <laughs>